Well, the president talked about, he talked, uh, there were some uh, perspectives about the elections, how he needed to see that uh, certain things are gotten right. But speaking about elections and what we need to do, how we need to progress, of course, in light of the president's speech, we've got Professor Atari Rujaga, former chairman of INEC, of course. He joins us from our studios in Abuja. Good morning, Prof, and thank you for joining us today. And happy Independence Day to you today. Hello, good morning, and uh, happy Independence to you too. Well, having listened to the president's speech today, what jumps out at you? I know he did pack a lot into that speech. Um, what is clear is that um, the speech was uh, carries quite a lot of the right things to be said on a day like this. Uh, but for me, the critical thing is not so much what is said, but how it is followed up. Uh, I think it's important to uh, uh, reflect on the issue of what government or governance needs to do uh, to ensure that when you call upon Nigerians to take pride in Nigeria, uh, there are certain things that uh, really uh, uh, encourages and helps them to be able to, to do that. And uh, also, uh, no doubt, I think it's, I, I must say that there is no doubt that Nigeria has come a long way uh, in the last 60 years. Uh, but it's also important to really not so much be in a celebratory mood, uh, but more... Uh, to use this period as a period of reflection and contemplation as to what do we want Nigeria to be in the next 60 years. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of challenges, and these challenges need to be addressed. And um, so um, I, I think a lot of things have been said by Mr. President, and uh, there are um, things to be said on this kind of day. Uh, but the key challenge for government and governance is how to act upon all of those things that have been said in order to give people the confidence that uh, really we are prepared to make the journey of the next 60 years as a united country that we can all take pride in, that we can all uh, 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 be happy that our fundamental needs and aspirations would be addressed and satisfied through the process of governance. Right now, there are challenges, and these challenges need to be addressed. And I think that should be the focus of our contemplation and reflections on this particular day. Well, we also do have uh, the Minister of State for Mines and Steel, uh, Uche Oga, joining us as well. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. And happy Independence Day to you as well. Well, the President's speech, I mean, yes, uh, in light of the current challenges, there are many who, there are quite um, some interesting perspectives that he put out on this speech. But of course, you all do know that, I mean, yesterday, the day before, even today, there are different groups, different parts of the country who still agitate for one thing or the other, who feel hard done by, who don't have that sense of togetherness. So. The president's, do you think the president's speech really uh, addresses some of those concerns? Because you have people who think, well, yes, we heard the speech, but in reality, that's not what is reflected out there. Good morning, gentlemen, and happy independence to my friends. Uh, well, I want to say that I want to appreciate Mr. President for this great speech on this auspicious occasion of our Diamond Jubilee as a nation. It is a speech that should arouse every Nigerian's mind and consciousness to a greater Nigeria. Because the president is talking about togetherness and there is no one, you know, togetherness we can achieve a lot. And I, I believe that I come from the Southeast of part of this country and we have a proverb that a broom can only be useful when it is used as a unit. So I believe that in his speech, he has touched most of the critical areas. And those areas are the areas that are so fundamental to our existence. And you know, in his speech, he didn't say I, he 
He said that we, which means that he believes in the totality of, in, of our country as a nation. And the, the speech is so unique that if we as a people can look at it, he said, I'm giving a foundation, a foundation that can drive the future of our great nation. And that is what we are talking about, talking about the reformation of the, the public sector. We are talking about giving infrastructure. We are talking about how to take us back to our original, which is agriculture and mining. If you look at this nation, a nation whereby as a people, we can be proud of tomorrow. Yes, the past, we cannot content, continue to talk about the past. The past is gone, but we're talking about the future and the future is where all of us belong to. If we all can join hands together with Mr. President, looking at his speech, I believe we have a greater nation, a, a greater future for our nation. Thank you. But you know, when he said that, we needed to also examine how we got here, perhaps to enable us move forward, having taken stock. So are we doing that as well? Because that's part of the concerns that a lot of people have when they still agitate. So are we going to gloss over some of those parts? Definitely the president is not glossing over. If you look at it, there are a lot of, there are a lot of discussions going on. A lot of inputs going on here and there. He's not saying that, look, I'm going to, you know, trade off any or part of the, the, the country. You can see what is going on. Even from the Niger Delta point of view, there's an agitation. Even from my own region, there's an agitation. Even from the West, there's an agitation. But President is doing, saying that, look, let us work together. It is a call, a call to work together as a people. So in this people calling for this unity, we are calling them together and say, look, let us come together. There's a point we meet to discuss the future of our nation, and which I think is the right uh, direction, uh, the right thing to do. Okay. Well, Professor, uh, one of the things that the president also said, you know, is part of what uh, uh, the minister just talked about now, which is that we should all work together, come together and have a conversation and all of that. But, you know, when he started, he talked about the fact that we should see ourselves in the light of Nigeria as a nation, not Nigeria as and from our regional, uh, individual regional perspectives. And he also talked about the fact that we consistently harp on what he called artificial fault lines. How do we even begin to address that? Uh, well, uh, with due respect, um, there are fault lines, and many of these are not artificial. No doubt, people tend to exaggerate these fault lines, and rather than addressing their minds to how to solve or address or correct these fault lines, uh, they tend to passionately uh, just agonize over them, without concrete uh, suggestions or ideas or action as to how to address them. Um, so I think what is significant uh, uh, as we reflect over Nigeria's future is first of all, there is need for fundamental reforms in the values and the orientations of those in governance. Uh, obviously, the values of selflessness of uh, public service rather than self-service uh, have been remarkably eroded in the last 60 years in the uh, uh, environment of governance. And there have to be fundamental reforms that can revive these values because governance cannot be impactful and make meaning for the ordinary Nigerian unless public servants or public officers are selfless and are focused on addressing the fundamental needs and the aspirations uh, of the people. So that's one area, you know, but, but, but there are other areas, obviously, uh, to, to have national accommodation, you need a fundamental rearrangement of the structures and the institutions of governance. And we talk a lot about it, and again, passionately, but very little is done in terms of addressing uh, some of these. And then, of course, there is also the issue of the attitude and the orientation 
of our politicians. And these are fundamental issues to be addressed. And the government needs to provide direction in terms of how uh, these challenges are, are addressed. Well, perhaps the, the issue to you might want to also help us understand a little better is, I mean, before we even solve the problem, of course, you have said it, that uh, there have been several things said, a lot of talk, a lot of conversations, but not so much has been done. Perhaps the issue to address first would be to even find out how did we get here so that even when we are able to address those issues, we don't retract. So can you, do you have any idea how we got here and how to ensure we don't get back should we succeed in addressing the fault lines you talked about? Um, to my mind, we got here uh, primarily because, regrettably, uh, our country has been bedeviled by bad governance and poor leadership. Uh, I say regrettably because, uh, uh, obviously, uh, historically, when we examine both the framework, the institutional framework, and the personalities that have occupied uh, governance, uh, it would seem to one as if a lot of attention has been devoted to contesting and getting into power without adequate preparation in terms of what to do when you get into uh, power. And uh, therefore, uh, there has been a lot of wastefulness of resources in this country. There has been a lot of misplacement of priorities in this country. Just look at the education sector or the social services or health sector. You can understand what I mean in terms of wastefulness of resources and not being able to address the fundamental needs uh, uh, and, and particularly the, the key issues that can help develop a nation. We have not invested appropriately in education. Uh, the pandemic has shown how uh, 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 our health sector and social services sectors uh, are, are, are really in very bad shape. Um, so, so and, and what caused this? I think what caused this historically is the way in which our governance system has evolved. Um, uh, uh, we've talked about corruption, we talk about insecurity, and a lot of it is attributable to the ways and the manners by which those who found themselves in governance uh, have really not appropriately utilized the opportunities to address the needs of the people, to bring people together, to give people a sense of direction, and uh, to ensure that people actually uh, 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 take pride in being Nigerians and also make appropriate sacrifices uh, for our country. So I think, to my mind, whereas there is need for value reorientation and structural and institutional reforms, fundamentally there is need to focus attention in terms of how we can make our governance system uh, to be characterized by selflessness, uh, by uh, 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 evidence-based policies and planning, and by rigorous pursuit uh, and uh, 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 implementation of whatever policies are designed. A lot of things that are said remain on paper, mm -hmm. and we, we seem to just move on. Today we say this, tomorrow we say that, and there is no actual targeted focus in terms of what is done with regards to implementation. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, a lot of it is related to the governance system and the value orientation uh, that over time has negated the essence of that uh, governance system. We have a lot of work to do if Nigeria in the next 60 years is to be one of the leading economies uh, uh, in this world and the, the so-called giant of Africa, we have to make fundamental uh, 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 reforms that address governance, that address institutions and the structure of governance in this country. Right. Now, Dr. Oga, Professor Jaga has done some diagnosis. In fact, he's prescribed some remedies to the challenges we face as a nation. Now, he mentioned a lot of things, really, but for a lot of people that are looking at some of those challenges bedeviling us, they wonder, what is there to celebrate? So if I can just take you back a moment, just before you respond to some of the issues you raised about those policies being on paper and how to take them off paper into reality. For those wondering, what is there to really celebrate Nigeria at 60? What do you tell them?
Thank you, my brother. First, let me let me say something which I've always said everywhere. What is lacking in Nigeria is for us to put up this project Nigeria, for everyone to have project Nigeria in mind, that we all together work in United People. But you see, that is what is creating the problem. You are in an office. Somebody say, oh, I'm from Yoruba land. This one say, I'm from Igbo land. This one, I'm from the north. Let us work to build a nation. And you can see what the president has done. He talked about foundation, the establishment of the national ethics and integrity policy. This will help us to moon a foundation of a nation. Yes, Professor Jaga has said it, but I keep telling people that we all have been in public office. When you are in public office, what did you do in changing the focus, the fundamentals of the office? Have you done anything? And for me, there's something to celebrate. We celebrate life. We celebrate togetherness. We celebrate that we are a united nation with diverse in terms of resources and minerals. If you look at it, the God has created us at a perfect unity. In the South, yes, you have minerals, uh, oil in the, in, in the South. In the North, you have equally, you have minerals. Uh, and then you have agriculture, land. All these things put together is what builds a name. We have this infrastructure, and God has given, if you look at it, there is unity in diversity. It, the way God has created us, he has put potentials in, in all of us. So I believe that, like what I say, if we together can come as a people, changing our understanding and belief that as a people that there is a need for us to change because change begins with you as a person. How do you take this nation as a Nigeria in whichever place you find yourself? And believing that, look, we are building in one nation. Forget about when it starts with you, when the change starts with you, you say, look, I have to do this and I must do it for the interest of this nation. I think we are getting it right. The president didn't say, oh, it is an uhuru for us. But he's saying that there is hope. And that is hope is what I'm lending my voice to. That there is hope. If we can look at all this uh, uh, national ethics and integrity policy, things that we are doing, a lot of things are being done. The first time you see that a lot of things are critically done for the interests of this nation as a leader. He's not saying I. He's saying that, come, let us build a focused, a united and entity called Nigeria for the interest of the future. If in our place, they say, if it begins to be okay today, better. That's what we're saying. If it begins to be all right for us as a people, that it collectively in whichever area you find yourself, start doing the right thing. I think there will be hope. For Nigeria, and that is where I stand. Right, I, I believe you're saying what we should celebrate is that hope for a better future, if I yes. get you correctly. But another yes. thing uh, Professor Jaga mentioned is the fact that one of the problems we've had is these policies, these things that you said are being done, stay on paper and they never come into reality. So how are we sure that these lofty ideas, these lofty policies that you have talked about don't remain on paper? No, de definitely that if you know this administration is not talking about paper it's talking about reality it's talking about the actual thing the president is walking the talk we don't talk about check, take for instance we don't talk about infrastructure and we don't see it in real times when you talk about okay road you say okay this road is done talk about this building is done you talk about even a, a um real you say this one is done we, we don't say things that we don't do when you talk about even when you talk about there's a review of the of the of the policies it is going on and what we are saying is that it is individual we we all of us all of us together wherever you find yourself public sector private sector in governance in academics 
do the right thing, walk the talk. And that is what the president is asking Nigeria. Let all of us walk the talk. It is not just about talking. And whatever the president is saying, he's doing because he's so passionate. When you, if, if you listen to the speech, it's a speech that has passion. Someone who wants to put in his best for a nation he believes in. So I, I, I believe that within the few years, you can see what is going on critically from all the sectors. Today, before now, Nigerians never knew about mining. It, it's never heard of. But today you can see that first in the history of a nation, we've been able to present gold bar artisanally mined in Nigeria. And we are telling Nigeria that we have capacities, there are a lot of minerals in Nigeria. And these things are things, we are, it's not just talking about it, you see that we are actualizing them. All so right. we'll, I believe we'll, that we'll, in uh, working the talk, this we'll, government we'll is, this. Is, is doing the right thing by ensuring that All right, no, Dr. whatever Oga. we say is we'll what we are doing. We'll return to this in just a moment, if you could just hang on. We'll be back, don't go away. The welfare of millions of people for generations to come may be affected by the wisdom which we here display. If Nigerian leaders and our British partners are to prove themselves worthy of their trust, now is the time for us solemnly and truly to dedicate ourselves to seeking the greatest good of the greatest number of our people in Nigeria. Let us therefore, Mr. Chairman, sir, close our ears to the Council of Despair, which says that we cannot here at this conference agree on a constitution. If there is any doubt among us as to what should be written into the Constitution, let us as Democrats that we profess ourselves to be refer such problems as the goal has done recently to the people whom we profess to represent either just before or at the federal elections late in 1959. Welcome back to our special edition of Sunrise Daily. It's Independence Day. Our theme, Nigeria, diamond in the rough. What are those things you suggest can be done to ensure that things at least get a lot better? The theme that the government is talking about is together. The president says the reasons why that was brought in such that we all can forge ahead together and become a lot better. But some of those concerns that you do have, feel free to let us know what they are. But let's get to Professor Jaganel. You did make some points about uh, being characterized by poor governance, poor leadership, and what we need to do to correct that. You talked about us putting in place a fundamental change. Could you speak to some of those? What specifically should we be considering at the moment? Okay, um, uh, first and foremost, I, I would like to say that when we look at the experiences of other countries worldwide, uh, countries develop uh, essentially uh, by the efforts and the energies and uh, the resourcefulness of uh, young people. Uh, and whether it is in terms of forging unity or improving productivity in all sectors of the political economy, young people have a fundamental role to play. Regrettably, in Nigeria, our young men and the women are increasingly being, if not demobilized, but terribly uh, demoralized. Uh, when you look at ed educational institutions, these really are not in a position to provide opportunities for tapping the potentials of our young men and women. 
But what is even more important is that people study and graduate and come out and there is a serious crisis in the job sector. Unemployment is terrible. And young men who are frustrated, who are demoralized, no matter how passionately you keep telling them to believe in one Nigeria, to believe in government and what it does, will just listen to you and will not have the commitment that is required to build a nation. They need to be inspired, and they need to be inspired not just by words, but by action in terms of uh, substantively what is being done to address unemployment, what is being done to strengthen cap human capital development in terms of education, in terms of research, and in terms of innovation. Uh, uh, in, in all our uh, institutions. And obviously, uh, regrettably, uh, the progress in these areas in our country is abysmal. So it's very, very important to, as I keep saying, uh, to say good things, yes, and the good things have been said in this very good uh, speech by Mr. President. But I think it's important that Mr. President and those around him now begin to say, look, what can we do substantively in addition to whatever we have been doing in order to really have very actionable, substantive and sustainable programs and policies that can help us to really get Nigerians to believe us and trust that we mean what we have said in turning things around in this country. As I speak with you, given the level of poverty, given the level of unemployment and given the passionate mobilization of religion and ethnicity. We have very serious challenges in terms of how we can get our young men and women to be passionately committed to Project Nigeria. And it's very important for what Nigeria becomes in the next 60 years uh, 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 to be able to ensure that we galvanize our young men and women to trust the governance process, to trust our leaders, and to also join hands with them in order to move this country forward. So action, passionate, selfless action, uh, really is very, very important. And uh, you have to inspire uh, uh, people to be able to get them to believe what you say and to also be able to participate uh, in the commendable uh, uh, aspirations that you have as a leader for uh, our country's development. So, so really, uh, I think we need to go beyond just uh, agonizing over our problems. We need to say what needs to be done fundamentally in order to reposition our country. Hmm. Nigeria has not explored its potentials in the, last six, in the past 60 years. And we do not want to get into the next 60 phase of getting to the next 60 years using the same framework, the same methodology and the same kind of leadership frame, uh, uh, because really it means that we may not be able to achieve our goals and objectives and aspirations uh, unless we reposition the country appropriately for that. And to my mind, we really have to pay a lot of attention to addressing the fundamental needs and the aspirations of the people of this country in order to galvanize them to join hands with leaders rather than to be demoralized and to, 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 to withdraw uh, uh, from the uh, general governance process. And uh, regrettably, those of us who study what is happening uh, see a lot of disturbing things in terms of people withdrawing uh, from the sphere of uh, 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 the public sector, but most especially from uh, just sitting down and looking what is happening rather than being passionately engaged in finding solutions to the challenges uh, which uh, affect our country. So, so really, uh, a focus on action rather than just on uh, statements uh, uh, is very, very important as we move forward. Okay, well, um, at the moment, we do have our correspondent, uh, Kayla Megua, who is in Eagle Square. Remember, there will be some activity that will go on there, so she's on hand to bring us up to speed in terms of what to expect and what is going on now. Hello, Kayla. Hello and happy
happy Independence Day to you. Uh, we are live at Eagle Square, significant because it's been 10 years since Independence Day was celebrated right here at Eagle Square. Remember in 2010 there was a bombing at, around this area, so since then Independence Day hasn't been celebrated here. We've had other celebrations though, May Day, we've had Children's Day, we've had Democracy Day, but Independence Day has been 10 years since that celebration was done right here at Eagle Square. So it is a bit, uh, it is a bit nostalgic for a lot of people who were here 10 years ago to be able to celebrate this uh, particular Independence Day here at Eagle Square and uh, we can see that the, um, the atmosphere is, you know, is, getting, is getting busy, so to speak. The security is very tight, I have to say that, incredibly tight security in and around the Eagle Square. So we are looking at uh, a lot of people coming in. Some people have already uh, started taking their seats in the stands, if you can see the stands right now. Uh, the President will be here, we hear, before 10, uh, before 10 a.m. and he'll be inspecting the guard and we're expecting to see marches and whatnot going on. Not as elaborate as it used to be, but uh, a celebration nonetheless. So if you can see, uh, if the cameras can just move around just so you can see what is going on. Uh, people taking their seats in the stands. We're seeing the marching band coming up. So a lot of people getting ready for the festivities that will begin here at 10 a.m. All right, thank you very much indeed, uh, Kayla. So we will keep uh, up to speed. We'll be on you in just a moment. So just hang on for us, Kayla. You have a long day today. <laughs> right, well, it's not, it's not really going to be... It's going to be fun. I hope uh, she's, she's able to cast oh, some yeah. fun there. Well, let's get back to uh, Professor Jiga. Um, there was something you said earlier about the need to bring in the, the younger ones, and uh, you have no idea how right you are on that one. Well, maybe you do, but because, of course, you know that a significant number of the voting population are young people. And as you have noted, many of them are, if not demobilized, they are demoralized. And uh, you've talked about how we may begin to find our way to bring in them back. But then there was a statement that the president made in that speech where he said the problem with the electoral process is largely human. Now, um, for him to have identified that, uh, he definitely has some figures and he looked at some things. So how do we even begin to address that when he talked about the problems with our electoral process being largely human? If that environment is there, I don't know if the younger person the young people will be very much interested. So how do we begin to create that kind of environment to remove those problems or those things that facilitate the problems in our electoral process, which are largely human, according to the president? Well, um, I, I agree that uh, uh, most of the challenges that we face in the electoral process in this country uh, are human-induced. And in fact, to even be more specific, they are really problems and challenges created by politicians uh, whose mindset is not democratic and whose mindset is to win elections by hook or by crook. Uh, obviously, there are other challenges with regards to uh, uh, strengthening the uh, lack of strong capacity within uh, the institution that uh, uh, conducts elections, whether at the state uh, uh, level, the CX, or at the federal level, the INEC. And I know that if you reflect uh, uh, um, uh, or uh, uh, examine what has happened uh, in the last uh, 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 several years or so, there has been uh, uh, what I call positive incremental, incremental positive changes in terms of improving the capacity of particularly uh, the National Electoral Commission, INEC, uh, to be able to conduct elections. And increasingly, you are also seeing uh, the value addition in that competence and capacity being translated into better and more improved elections. Still, a lot needs to be done in that regard. But the major challenge is the attitude and the disposition of so-called politicians both in the political and in the electoral uh, processes. We cannot build democracy without Democrats. And unfortunately, uh, most of our politicians do not have a democratic uh, 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 um, uh, predisposition in their engagement in the electoral process. You know, it's, it's either 
challenges of internal party democracy and the recruitment of candidates, you know, uh, when either godfathers or authoritarian uh, despots dominate political parties and try to do what they like, uh, which also creates instability in the whole party uh, 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 formation and, and the electoral contest uh, processes, but most especially uh, because also these so-called godfathers uh, uh, use money uh, or primordial uh, sentiments in terms of how they recruit people who uh, uh, are uh, 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 placed to contest uh, elections. Uh, so, so yes, it's human, but human attributable mostly to those who the prevailing tendency now in our political and the electoral uh, processes. So we need to reform uh, the attitude and the mindset and the disposition of our so-called politicians. But we cannot just plead with them to do that. And that is why I, I consistently now keep saying that uh, people should not remain fence sitters and onlookers. The more people that get involved into the political and the electoral processes, with a better and a more democratic understanding and disposition in their engagement, perhaps the better our chances of reforming and therefore addressing uh, that human factor that undermines uh, the integrity of the electoral and political processes. But we have a lot of work to do uh, in that regard. Of course, uh, uh, institutional reforms and legal reforms, particularly, for example, improvement in the legal framework for the conduct of elections uh, would go a long way. Um, we really need to review our electoral laws from one electoral cycle to another with a view to tightening uh, the framework and ensuring that uh, there are no gaps that politicians can continue to exploit uh, in order to advance their uh, selfish particularistic interests. So we need to strengthen our democratic framework and the electoral framework. And one key way to do that is to deal with the attitude of our politicians, right. while at the same time we continue to improve the competence and capacity of the uh, independent electoral commissions, whether at the federal or the state level, to be able to uh, deliver and conduct elections with integrity. All right. Now, Dr. Orgal, let me get your response to Professor Chega's opinion regarding our politics, the electoral system, in the light of this question. Let me couch it this way. For a lot of young people, I mean, gleaning from what they say on and off social media, they think we're where we are today partly because of what they call the recycling of the same people in our politics, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, still the same names and the same faces. And I think that is a, a huge part of the challenge we have as a nation. So in terms of you know, fixing our political system, the electoral system, how do we deal with that challenge that a lot of young people say, we can't move forward without sorting that, getting fresh ideas on board? Thank you very much. And uh, I want to appreciate Professor Jagad for being very truthful to the point that uh, the evil that is bedeviling the political system in Nigeria. And when you look at those issues critically, you can see that he has been able to see the truth. Uh, the truth is that, look, we, the issue that I, I want to thank Mr. President for us to, for him bringing back history. History is a key thing that is needed in every nation for you to understand where you are coming from and where you are. And the issue that you find out that most people, uh, when you look at a political system, you equally blame the younger ones. Because where somebody would believe that it's collecting 5,000 to vote somebody who cannot contribute to his future is the only way for him to benefit. He doesn't believe that I need to vote because I want to vote out someone who cannot give me any future. So you find out that that is what is constituting most of the problem. One, the political, so-called political governors who are not Democrats. They are not Democrats in any way. They don't believe even in the future of this country. Even when you talk about all the issues we have today, calling it banditry, calling it criminality, is caused by these people because when you hire these people and use them for election because you want to win at all, by all means, at the end of the day, you didn't make any uh, future provisions for these people that you have hired to give them a better life. 
then you have given them the latitude to operate as criminals. When you look at it, I, I believe that, like what you have said, establishing the national ethics and integrity policy will strengthen even INEC. Because, yes, we cannot rule out INEC in the whole quagmire of political crisis or uh, issues we have in Nigeria. So the youth need to, you see, if you have the youth and they decide to vote, they can vote out anyone if you right. are given the opportunity. Like Professor Jaga right. said, in most states, you cannot run any local government election with the state government and then you have opposition winning even a single seat. Reason being that they will sit down and, you know, create what they want and then announce it. All right, Dr. Oga. So there is no, if we need, we need strengthen the framework all right, pardon of me. the, of if, if, even um, both the look, the state, the state, uh, uh, okay. let, let me bring uh, in, pardon me on that one. Me, the state, uh, we, we've got, uh, Ademola I mean, Abbas. Hello? Just hold on a minute. We, the national electoral process or the state electoral process, they all need to be strengthened. All right, doctor. Just hang on a minute. We, we've got um, Ademola Abbas. He's a professor of international law and global affairs expert. He joins us as well to weigh in on this day. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Well, you might have heard uh, a lot of what the guests have said and the president's speech and some of the issues he highlighted. So could you tell us your impressions about his speech in the light of Nigeria at 60? Thank you very much, Jimbali. I hope you can hear me. Yes, please. Can you hear me, Lord? Can you hear me, please? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, it was a great speech uh, from the point of at least recapping uh, a few things, uh, where we've got it wrong a bit and where we need to go. Uh, first, let me say uh, it was a fantastic response. Uh, I've been listening to from the two gentlemen, especially uh, Professor Jega, who, uh, and I, I agree with him entirely, felt, look, for us to be able to go forward, we need to know where we are coming from. That is very important. Uh, we cannot take the president's speech as though it is a holy grail. You know, it's a great speech, no doubt about that. And as Professor Jega said, it's a speech that we needed at, that, at this particular point in our life. Nigeria has become bitterly divided on so many fronts, religion, ethnicity, this, that, and things that we should not be grappling with as a nation after 60 years of independence. So from that point of view, it's a wake up call for all Nigerians to come together and channel a path forward. But now, in going forward, we must be careful how we move. It's important. And that is why the first thing we need to do is to learn lessons from the past. What did we do wrong? And I'm so happy that Professor Jega used a particular phrase, incremental development. That is so far what we have done in a long way since 60 years ago. We've been moving incrementally, very, very slowly, very, very marginally. It's one step forward, 10 steps backward. We can no longer afford that. And there are some concrete su suggestions I've, I've heard this morning, for instance, uh, the need to reform, to restructure the institutions of democracy completely. We need to do that so that we won't be sort of putting round pegs in square hole, which is what we have done uh, uh, for, for a long time. Again, another thing is, you know, uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, gentlemen, uh, I think Dr. Oga was talking about uh, the youth. The role of the youth in Nigerian politics is, is important. And they talk about the godfatherism. Let me say one or two things about that. We keep forgetting that for there to be a godfather, there must be godsons and goddaughters. Now, what that means is that when people who probably should not be in a particular political position of power, maybe because they are not, they don't merit at that point in time, they were prodded on by godfathers together. Don't ever forget that that same godfather is interested in keeping you in that place and in ensuring his future. Now, if you are so silly, permit me to use the word, as to allow yourself to be used to trump meritorious, to trump meritocracy, to trump people who are qualified to get into a post, and you allow yourself to get into that post, then when the time comes and the godfather is hungry and you choose not to feed him, look, if you ride on the back of Tiger, you always end up in his belly, pure and simple. So, and that is where we have to be sure that the middle class is complicitous in Nigeria. Until the middle class come together and, you know, can look at the problems of the country holistically and say, look, we need to be honest with each other. We have been complicitous. We have put the godfather zone. We are the godsons. We are because I don't know you ever hear the word godfathers and god, godsons and goddaughters as if godfathers just appear in the. Don't get me wrong. Godfatherism must be eliminated by all means, by all progressive minds in this country. It's a, it's a battle that Nigerians must win. 
Otherwise, we'll be just going in circles over and over again. The role of the youth. Look, they just completed Big Brother Nigeria. And I've been talking to a lot of kids, a lot of youth. I said, look, for goodness sake, the length at which Nigerian youth go to vote people. People, I was opportune to watch one of the episodes just for the fun of it with some of the some of young, 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 young girls. And I said, look, tell me, in the last 40 minutes we've been looking at this thing, all I saw was somebody trying to put uh, uh, what is it called? Makeup on their faces. So what have you benefited in the last 40 minutes? And she looked at me and said nothing. I said, so why? But when election times come round, the same youth, 18, 20 year old, university undergraduate will say, oh, I don't care. I can't I can devote, devote one hour of my time to go and queue and vote for people who are going to impact your life, not just for eight years, but for the rest of your life. You haven't got that time. So there is need for massive reorientation of the youth. Make no mistake, the youth are learning from the, from the elders, so to say. You know, they're looking at those who are governing us and saying, what is in it for me? In any way, my votes don't count. But we can't give up on Nigeria. For me, that is the most important message from the president's speech today. We cannot give up on Nigeria. Look, yeah. Chamberlain and Ayo and I've I've spent about 20 years of my life overseas. And I came back and I said, look, we need to be more, but, uh, more, more what, tolerant of our own heritage. Don't let's write our country off. All right, Today we look at the United States. I was shocked last month uh, when our American are, are, we, were, we have to let it go at that point Trump in time. Step aside or not, okay. if he loses the election. Professor Hello. Abbas, we have to go. We, we do so thank you saying, for your what thoughts. Is that we need to be, you know, more. No, uh, Pardon me, Professor Abbas. Uh, we do thank you very much forward. indeed for your thoughts this morning. Uh, we have to thank you all. As a matter of fact, uh, Professor. About Adimal Abbas is a global affairs and the professor of law. Uh, we also have had Professor Atari Jaga, former chairman of INEC. We thank you, Prof, for talking to us as well today. As well as uh, Dr. Uche Oga, Minister of State for Mines and Steel. Thank you all for talking to us today on the program. We will be back in a moment. Join us again.